All right. Hey, Merry Christmas, Flatirons. How we doing? We all right? I know. So you haven't been here in a while. Pastor Jim got a mustache. Yeah. All right. I want to shave it off. My wife won't let me. She thinks it's awesome. Um, no, no, hey, hey, before we jump into this real, really quick, I, I just wanna say this. Um, so um, all, all of December, we do this every year around here, uh, we carve off a big chunk of our offering and, and take a special offering uh, for, for our partners. Uh, so I'm not even talking about money for flowers, I'm talking about uh, things that really beat towards, uh, God's heart beats towards us. Uh, over the last few years, we've given away, you know, dozens and dozens of cars. We've we started a prison ministry down in Lyman. Uh, we've just done so much. We, uh, we raised money for Next Gen because of mental health crisis and things like that, like four and a half million dollars that we've been taking care of, uh, of kids all over, all over Denver and the world, really, really. This, this year, our heart, we've really been drawn to uh, two things especially. One is uh, kids that are in the foster care system and the families, uh, the heroic families, I would say, that are taking care of these kids until they find a permanent uh, place t- to land. And that's a, that's a really, really, really hard life. And so, so we're kind of trying to raise money to support them with, with, with groups around them and care and counseling, all those kinds of things. The other thing is, my heart really beats towards this, is uh, towards uh, ending the large largest uh, financial growing entity in the world today, and that's human trafficking of kids, right? God's kids are not for sale, and we wanna see that stop. And so we are partnering with different organizations uh, around the country here and around the world uh, to take care of foster care families and also uh, to end trafficking and get those kids out of trafficking, get them restored back to normal life and find them a home that they can go back to. And over the last three weeks, I'm really, really proud. This is the most generous church I've ever been a part of. Uh, I think earlier today we hit $1.1 million that are gonna go to these organizations, which I think is just fantastic. Um, and, and so here's why, so some of you are like, you, you haven't been here in a while, and that's fine, but uh, if you say, well, I wanna be involved in that too, you can go to flatironschurch.com slash Christmas giving, and all four of our partners that we're going to be uh, working through, you can give directly to them if you wanna do that, or you can give to Flatirons, and, and 100% of it goes, goes away, but we wanna see that. I'm really, really, really proud of, of, of this church because whenever we say, hey, God's doing something over there, this church gets behind it, and so if you wanna be a part of that, then you jump in, in with us, okay? So, hey, let, again, let me, let me jump in this. I'm gonna welcome you to Flatirons especially if you're new, like, like uh, how many of this is your first, uh, your first Christmas at Flatters? First Christmas at Flatters. Okay, awesome, all right, so, so I, I, welcome, all right, right? So a lot of us, you know, we haven't been here in a while. All right, let's be honest, all right? We, maybe because as kids we grew up being drug off to church. My dad was a pastor. I didn't miss church ever, ever, all right? But then, you know, life gets busy and we get a little disillusioned or maybe the, the church that you grew up in was really boring and felt irrelevant and then you went to college and then it just got boring and so you quit, all right? But there's still something inside of us, all right, that says, but I should go on Christmas and Easter, we call you creasters. That's what we call you. Um, and there's no, I'm not throwing stones. I'm glad you're here. Regardless of what brought you here, right? Uh, it's a holiday tradition. And then we go, you know, do something else. Uh, maybe you lost a bet. Maybe your parents say you can't have presents unless you go to church with me. Uh, maybe this actually happened a couple of years. You got caught in traffic and you thought this was Walmart. And you're like, I, I can't find the toy section. All right. Well, welcome, no matter what. Um, the, here's the problem. The problem or really the challenge of just showing up at church like on holidays, Christmas, Easter, is that you kind of come in here expecting the same thing, right? You expect, like, like we're gonna sing the same songs, like Christmas songs, and then someone like me gets up and tells the story of Mary and Joseph and the baby, and Jesus being born in a manger, and some angels, and some shepherds, and some wise men, and we sing Silent Night, and then we go, and we burn some candles, then we go home, and we chug bourbon-spiked eggnog, right? And wait for the mob to show up. That's my plan, all right? Um, and to be honest, some of that is gonna happen, especially the eggnog, but... Um, but I think this year, really, I think this year, okay, you're gonna hear something new tonight. And I say that because I've been doing this for 40 years, and what I wanna teach you tonight, it's brand new to me. I mean, it's been in the Bible the whole time, I just missed it, right? So that's kind of been a theme, all right? So let me explain that. Um, let me ask you a question, all right? And I'm gonna ask the same question at the end, all right? Have you ever, have you ever asked God to give you a sign like to let, to let you know that he's there, right, right? Like, like, like when, when I was a kid one time, I mean, I, I grew up in church, I believed in God, I don't remember not believing in God, but every once in a while I'd pray a prayer that goes something like this, hey God, if you're there, like move that pencil. <laughs> anybody, anybody else, right, right? Like move it, right? And if it would've moved, I, I would've pooped my pants. I'm like, mom, right, right, right? But it's like, I just need a sign. Probably the weirdest sign, um, and I think I told this a few years ago, but, but like sometime when I was a little kid, I watched this Christmas movie or TV show, something like that, and in this show, um, on Christmas Eve, animals could talk at midnight. 
Anybody see that? Anybody see that show? Right? It's there. It's a real show, right? Right? And so I, I, I thought, I'm trying this. Okay, I need a sign from God. So I, I made myself stay awake on Christmas Eve up till midnight, and then I kidnapped my sister's little dog Susie, and I put her on the bed. And at midnight, I went, "Go, like say say something, all right? Please, God, if you're there, make Susie talk." And you know what happened? Nothing. She was like, <laughs> all right, right, right. And, and and I'll be honest, I was like nine years old, and my faith took a hit. And then I processed and realized a few years later, oh, this makes sense. Susie was a Pekingese. <laughs> so she spoke Chinese. I should have said, ni hao ma. And then she would have gone, ah, you're all right. But I asked for a sign and I didn't, I didn't get one. Um, well, let me explain a little context for today. Since, since August, uh, if you've been around here, uh, we have spent the last four months here at Flatirons. We've been going really slow. We've been going through the first 11 chapters of, of the Bible. In the first 11 chapters of the Bible, you can see not only God's plan for us and for creation, but in those first 11 chapters, you can see what went wrong, primarily through three rebellions, but, but it led to the world being as screwed up as it is right now. It's all found on the first like, 11 chapters of the Bible. And the overall theme of this semester has been pretty much hidden in plain sight. I mean, we've been taking a look at some passages in the Bible that, again, have been there since the Bible was written thousands of years ago, but, but we slowed down over the last few months, and we've taken a look at, there's some weird stuff in there, folks. Like we, like we look at the weird stuff, and it's usually the parts that are weird that we miss or we skip over them because we're like, I don't know what that's talking about. Or worse yet, there's some stories in the Bible that we've heard so many times since we were little kids, we just assume, I know what that means, but the truth is, we might not. We, we might have missed something. But woven through the pages of the Bible, cover to cover, e even in some of the weirdest stuff in there, right, is this ongoing promise from God that death and condemnation and guilt and shame and separation from God, that's only temporary. And at a certain point in time, God would send a deliverer, a savior, a Christ, a Messiah. It's all the same thing, all right, who will reverse the consequences of those first 11 chapters, right, and, and rebellion against God and restore. And a guy named Paul in the Bible says this, and restore and make all things new. Wouldn't that be nice? And we now know that's Jesus, which is why we're here tonight celebrating his, his birthday. But here's the thing, all right? Living in 2023, we have the luxury of looking back over history and, and seeing how it happened. Like we can look back, oh yeah, all right? But as it was, like leading up to it, and as it was happening, like in the moment, no one knew what God was doing. No one knew how God was going to do it. As a matter of fact, uh, this one guy named Paul who wrote a big chunk of the Bible, and I'm gonna refer to him several times tonight, he calls what we now know, it used to be like a secret. Like, like look at this, Paul, Paul says, and we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. So it's for us. None of the rulers, and I put in the word demonic there because in context, he's actually talking about, there's some weird stuff going on in, in the universe, right? But he says, none of the demonic rulers of our age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Meaning this is that if Satan and his spiritual cohorts had realized that by crucifying Jesus on that cross, they would be playing right into God's hand on how he was gonna pay for our sin and to defeat death. They, they never would have nailed him to a cross. So all through the Bible, though, there are hints and pieces of what Jesus will be and do when he gets here. But here's the thing about the Bible, right? Um, it's not written like a, like a novel or a book, right? It's not written in sequential order, but it's more of, like, like my professor said it like this, it's more like of, of a mosaic and you had to stand back and then take the picture, the pieces, and kind of assemble and go, I'll take that here and take that. And then it makes a storyline. But see, God, God is not a God who hides himself. He wants us to know him. And from the beginning, he tells us that, and this is really important, if we'll pay attention, that's important. If we'll just pay attention, he says, I will send you signs and signals that I am moving or about to move. And one of the primary ways that he has revealed that throughout history is, is through the stars and the heavens. And it's cover to cover in the Bible, right? Um, in the opening verses of creation, back in Genesis 1, on page one, right? God says that when he created the sun and the moon and the stars, he said this, this is God talking, and let them, sun, moon, stars, be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And the Jewish people, the Moses who wrote this, and the Jewish people who, who first you know, read this, they, they studied the stars and the planets, and they considered them, the universe, to be mathematically perfect. And by the way, our scientists do too. They say it's crazy how mathematically precise the universe is. But the, the Jews believe that it reflected the perfect mind of God. 
And they based their calendar and the passing of time was based on the position of the stars and they set their holidays and their festivals according to the movement and the alignment of planets and stars. By the way, we still do that. We still do that. But they went another step further. They considered these lights in the sky to be one of the methods that God was communicating to them what he was doing or about to do. So that's on page one. That's how the world begins. But Jesus himself, this is gonna get a little weird, right? He, he said the same thing about how the world is gonna end. This is Jesus talking. Look at this. He says, and there will be, there it is, signs in sun and moon and stars. That's from chapter one. And on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity. Welcome to America. Because, I just, that's editorial comments. I'm just throwing those in for you, right? Um, because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they, we, will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, remember this part, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. Now all through the Bible, we are told that when God is, is doing something or about to do something, look up. Pay attention and raise your head. In other words, pay attention and look up because God is about to intervene in our world and do something new. It starts that way, it ends that way. In the middle of the Bible, that Paul guy, right, that I talked about earlier, he says this. He says, if you will simply pay attention to nature, right, and creation, and mountains, and skies, and stars, and the ocean, and animals, and all that, if you'll just pay attention, well, here's what he says. And I, listen, he says, um, he uses the pronoun them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna personalize it, I'm gonna make it us, because it applies to us, all right? Everybody cool with that? If not, go to another church. Here we go, so, for what can be known about God is plain to us, because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, here it is, have been clearly perceived. You can see it. Ever since the creation of the world, where? In the things that have been made, to what extent? So that we are without excuse. Later, Paul is writing in that same letter to people about this is who Jesus is and what he did through his birth, through his life, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, his ascension back to heaven. And he goes on, he says this. I just wanna tell you, anybody who calls on the name of Jesus, you can be saved, forgiven, restored, reconnected back to God. You just call on Jesus and he'll save you. But then he goes on and asks some other questions. But how can people call on the name of Jesus unless they know about Jesus? That's smart. And how will people know about Jesus unless they hear about Jesus? And how will they hear about Jesus unless somebody goes and tells them about Jesus? And then he asks a follow-up question that I have missed for 40 years. Look at this. He asked this question right after that. But I ask, have they not heard? Right? And then he answers, indeed they have. For, look at this, their voice has gone out to all the world and their words to the ends of the, of the world. Now leave that up there. The question is, who's he talking about? Whose voice has gone out? Whose words have already gone out to the ends of the world so that every person right now has heard from God? We don't have an excuse. Well, if you notice, that last sentence is in quotation marks, meaning Paul is quoting from some other place. In this case, a place in the Bible. In this case, Psalm chapter 19. So, so look at this. Psalm chapter 19 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard, or has not been heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of, of the world. Now leave that up there, okay? So what we find out is, this is who's speaking. Look at it, the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. That the sky proclaims God's handiwork. The day pours out speech. The night reveals his knowledge. There's no person who hasn't heard his voice. Why? And here's the part Paul put in quotation marks because their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Paul, this is what Paul is saying. He's saying God is saying that his creation continually does this even now. And applying it to those, those same stars and planets and heavens and the skies, the day and the night are all speaking and announcing, here's the message of the heavens. Jesus is who he said he is. Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died for our sins, Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus conquered death. Jesus is the one who is the promised one of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Now here's why I tell you all that. The people who wrote the Bible and the people who first read the Bible, they believed because God said it was true, so they just, we're going with that. If he, this is what they believe. If you pay attention to what is going on in the heavens, it would be possible to determine that God was doing something unusual in our world. 
Now, before we get into this any further, I gotta clear up some craziness. Because we're gonna get crazy here in a minute, all right? So, this is not the same thing or some brand. Of, this is not astrology that says stars control people's destiny, like, like my horoscope or my Chinese menu or something like that. No, no, no. That claims that if you were born under a certain month, under a certain sign or constellation, somehow the stars, the constellation, determines your destiny, your personality, your, your, your fate. And the answer to that is no. The Jewish people, and we must, must look at that and go like, no, that's, no, that's heresy, Star, right, stars do not control anyone's fate. You know, how can you say that? Because they're flaming gas balls in the sky. That's all, that, right? Only God determines a person's fate or destiny. But God, according to his word, so I'm not even making this stuff up, all right? God says, and he, he can and does use these flaming gas balls in the sky to communicate a message. And the message goes like this, pay attention, I'm about to intervene in your life, in your world, and do something new, and if you'll pay attention, you'll see it. So straighten up and look up. So here's what I wanna do, I'm tying this into Christmas, I promise. I, I wanna look at some familiar characters from the Christmas story who were paying attention to what was happening, and the reason they were paying attention is because they made their living studying the stars, okay? I wanna look at the wise men, all right? So if you have your Bibles with you, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter two. By the way, if you, if you forgot a Christmas present, there's free Bibles in the back, and go, I was thinking of you, all right? And you'll look so spiritual, all right? So, so Matthew chapter two, here, here we go, okay? Now, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men, or maybe your Bible says magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. So let me give some history there, okay? So, so, so Herod, uh, uh, so the whole country's been conquered by, by, by the Roman Empire, but they put Herod in place to keep control. So Herod is Roman, Rome's puppet king. He works for Rome. And then, then we, the other characters, we have these, these wise men, these magi, there's no mention of three of them, but they come from some other country to the east of Israel, and they come to Jerusalem looking for, I'll quote them, the newborn king of the Jews. And the reason they are looking for the newborn king of the Jews is because something in the stars said, he's being born. Now we'll get back to that in a minute. I'm gonna blow your mind, I promise, all right? But they made a mistake. They stopped by the palace of the current king of the Jews to ask for directions. And it doesn't go well. So look at this. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And that's really, really, really important, okay? All Jerusalem was troubled because King Herod is troubled because when King Herod gets troubled, everybody runs for cover. This is, this is a historical fact. There's books written about, the non-biblical non books written about Herod. He was a paranoid schizophrenic. He was convinced that everybody in his life was trying to steal his throne. So if he thought you were gonna, he had plans to steal his throne or his kingdom, he had you killed. He executed at least one of his wives, Still had nine more, so whatever. But anyway, he, uh, he killed at least three of his children. He killed his brother-in-law and countless others. Uh, Caesar in Rome, when he heard about the pile of bodies in King Herod's like, courtyard, this is what he said uh, about King Herod. It is safer to be one of his dogs than a member of his family. So Herod, is free. Herod got triggered, okay? Verse seven, look at this. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And that's a lie. Right? After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures. They offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And when Herod finds out he's been tricked, he has every baby boy in that part of the country, two years and younger, executed, hoping that that newborn king gets killed. But an angel tells the tells the wise men, but also an angel tells Joseph and Mary they escaped to Egypt until after Herod is dead, and that's the Christmas story. I wanna go back to the Magi. Like, why are they here in the first place? This is fascinating to me. First, let me tell you, a Magi or a wise man um, is a sanitized way to say they were pagan astrologers. They weren't Jewish, they weren't Christians, there weren't any yet, all right? Uh, they weren't kings, there's no mention there were three of them. I think that comes from the song or three gifts, right? Gold rings, oh, it must have been three, right? They were from another Middle Eastern, maybe even Far Eastern country, 
right? They, they studied the stars. They were scientists. They were astronomers. They were mathematicians. And they studied stars and planets and what they might be communicating to us by their placement and their movements. The question is, what did they see up there? What did they see up there that said, pack up the camels, let's go east? What, what, right? So I wanna throw, I wanna throw something out to you that it's, it freaked me out, I'll be honest with you. It's pretty new to me. Even though it's been right there in my Bible for the last 2,000 years and counting. I just missed it. And it, again, it blows my mind in a really good way. Here's what I know. Some of you go, you go I, don't, I don't believe that. You're gonna get in your car and go home you know, on the way to wherever you're going, going, I don't believe that. That's fine, you're wrong. But that's all right, all right? Some of you go, that's speculative. Or some of you gonna call it a conspiracy theory, which if you wanna talk more about that, see me later, all right? But you know, make up your own mind, okay? But I wanna look at a passage of scripture that I have never associated with the Christmas story, and after tonight, I don't think you'll ever be able to do anything else but go, that's actually Christmas. And it's not found in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's found in the book of Revelation. Ooh, <laughs> the spooky book, right, right? And chapter 12, if you wanna find it, it's in the end of your Bible, okay? And so you're looking for that. Revelation, you're gonna wanna find this. I really promise you're gonna like, we should have brought a Bible. All right, so the book of Revelation was written by one of Jesus' best friends. His name is John, and it's the last book to be written and then added to the Bible. John was given the privilege of prophetically seeing and then writing down, this is how the world ends. This is the, how this present age comes to an end with the second coming of Jesus. And several times throughout the book of Revelation, John says, I looked up into the heavens and I saw this or I saw that. And in Revelation chapter 12, that's where we're gonna be, this is one of those times. So I'm gonna read all the way through it. Then we're gonna go back and we're gonna break it down as to what might be happening and what they saw up there in the, in the, in the sky. And then you can make up your own mind. But it's gonna freak you out in a good way, okay? Revelation chapter 12, here we go. And a great sign appeared in the heavens. So John's looking at the sky, all right? A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth, birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns, and on his heads seven diadems or crowns. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to, important part here, a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So, so John is looking at the heavens, he's looking at the stars, and he sees a pregnant woman about to give birth, right? To who? Skip down to verse five. She gives birth to a male child who will rule all the nations with a rod of iron, which means justice. So this is a direct quote from Psalm chapter two, which is a messianic prophecy of the coming Messiah. So the one thing we know that John has seen, John has seen in the stars the birth of Jesus. That's Jesus. And the reference to God, uh, the child being caught up to God is referring to after Jesus rose from the dead, he, he ascended into heaven because Satan, the dragon, is not able to defeat him. Now that's cool. It gets cooler. See, if John is staring at literal stars and see what he sees, all right, then that means this, is that there was a moment in history when we were given a description of how those actual stars would have been aligned in, in the sky over Jerusalem that paint the picture that John said, I see a dragon, I see a woman. And not only that, we can take, this is, this is so cool, we can take all those, that data, all that description in those paragraphs, we can plug it into a, a, a computer and run an astronomy program backward and come up with the date when, uh, in the past when all of those elements, those stars, when they all lined up in the sky over Bethlehem, over Jerusalem. Here we go, right, right? So, so you know, he's nuts, he's lost it, I know, all right? And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains from the agony of giving birth. Okay, look at the screen back here, okay? So on the screen here, you see the moon, all right? And you see the sun. And then you also see this line, it's called an ecliptic, all right? And that's a, astronomers like, like do that to track the movement of the constellation uh, of the stars, okay? So there's a lot of constellations of it. Look at all of them, all right? So you're going, there's mine, there's mine. Don't say that, all right, right? So, so that's all of them. I wanna, I wanna zoom in on Virgo. All right, so you notice the sun and the moon, right? They're there. And the sun is in the midst of the woman, Virgo, virgin. It's the only constellation that's female. And she's called the virgin, right? 
So it's not a hard thing to figure this out, okay? So you got Virgo. If you look close, there are 12 stars around her head. But again, she's the woman with the 12 stars, the virgin who's about to give birth, the sun is in her midst, and the moon is at her feet. There, she's in the sky. Now you'll, you'll notice above her head, all right, the astronomers, all right, um, the, the astronomy program shows Regulus and Jupiter. And they're not mentioned in Revelation 12, but if you put all that information in the computer, all right, into an astronomy program, th these pop up. What's the big deal about Regulus and Jupiter? Well, Jupiter was known as the king planet because it's the biggest. And Regulus was viewed as the king star because it was the brightest one. And here, there was a day in history where they overlapped, where they were superposed on each other from the view in Bethlehem. And for a short time, their brightness was multiplied. Now, if you're one of those old magi guys, all right, that's gonna get your attention because everything there is associated with kingship. So to review, we have a constellation Virgo, virgin, which is the only constellation represented by a woman. For 20 days, Virgo was clothed with the sun, but the exact day when the moon was under her feet, at the same time, and at the same time when Regulus and Jupiter intersected, again, over Jerusalem, that could only have occurred in an 80-minute window within those 20 days that it was present. Astronomy is linked to time. We can calculate the exact moment, not down to the days, but to the minutes. Now, what's the constellation above Virgo? It's the lion, Leo. What's that mean to a Jew? The lion is the sign of what tribe? Judah. Judah is the tribe of King David, and the tribe that the prophecy says the Messiah will come from, the king will come from. So you have Judah, the king tribe, Regulus, the king star, Jupiter, the king planet, are intersecting in the lion. And you gotta imagine the conversation. The, ma the Magi are like, hey, like, do you see what I see? C come on, that's, a, that's, that's good. I just made that up earlier. I'm not, like, like, I mean, ch check it out, right? And then they have this conversation, like, like, like so what's that story about that? There's a, con like, there's a Jewish king, like, what tribe is he supposed to come from? Oh yeah, Judah, lion, right? Well, let's go, let's go find him. In the future, one of Jesus' title is he's the lion of Judah, if you come to Flatlands very often, you'll hear his songs, he's the Lion of Judah, he's the Lamb that was slain. It gets even better, if you look, if you notice below her feet, in modern astronomy programs, we have two constellations, one is Libra and the other is Scorpio. In the ancient world, they were one constellation, it was a scorpion with pinchers, and scorpions back then were sometimes referred to as dragons, but you have another option for the dragon, and that is Hydra, also located below Virgo. So would they thought about Hydra being the dragon, or would they thought about Scorpio being, the, and it doesn't matter. You got two dragon choices, right? And he's ready to devour this child when he's born. Now, if you look at these pictures, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on there. There's the, the intersection of Regulus and Jupiter. It's in Leo, the Lion of Judah. You have the pregnant woman, the virgin. The sun is at, in her midst. The moon is at her feet. And of course, you got the dragon there waiting to eat everything, all right? There's a small window of time when all those things were present at the same time. And the date is 3 BC. But we can go, we can go even more, all right? And this, is gonna, this part's gonna freak some of you out. The exact date is September 11th, 3 BC. It's the only 80 minute window of time when all those things are present over Bethlehem and, Jer and Jerusalem. Now, time out, I'm not going there. Do you think that that, shut up. All right, listen, all right, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 see me down front, I'm like, oh, let's get, all right, right, right. I do wanna point something else out about that date. September 11th, 3 BC, also corresponds to Rosh Hashanah. That's the Jewish New Year. It's the day of trumpets. It also marked the inauguration day for every new Davidic king of Israel. This is when the people of Israel celebrated their new king, which explains why Herod lost his mind. Because on the day when people should have been celebrating his kingship, the wise men show up and say, you're not even the legitimate king of Israel. The real king of Israel and of the heavens has just been born, and we've come to worship him, not celebrate you. And we were led here by his star. Where's your star? He said, well, that's all coincidence. Maybe. Or the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So go back to what Paul wrote in Romans. All creation testifies 
of, of Jesus. The heavens declare. Their voice goes out to every person on the planet. There is a Jesus. Pay attention. But right after this, Paul writes this. Even though God has shown himself to everyone throughout history, there's some people that go, they won't listen. They won't pay attention. I don't want it to be true. Why? Why? Well, I'm gonna make a statement and it, it's gonna hurt some of your feelings. Um, it's still true. You make a horrible king of your own life. You make a horrible queen of your own life. You, you really, and you make a worse God. See, let's think about Herod. The one thing that King Herod never possessed, never had. I mean, he had palaces, he had servants, he had money, he had wealth, he had fame, he had right. The one thing he did not have was peace. See, when you're king of your own life, I got, I got this, all right? When you live your whole life in paranoia, trying to protect what's yours and defend what you've built for you, all right? I, I, I was in, riding my truck the other day thinking about this, and I thought, you know, almost everything that I am currently stressed out about, and there's a, there's a list. The parts of my life that steal my energy and my joy, that I just, I have, I have these conversations. Do anybody else have con imaginary conversations? When I talk to her, I'm, all right? Am I the, I'm on meds, I'm pray for me, all right, all right, but... How about this? There's some stuff I want to fix, and I don't. I can't figure out how to fix it. I keep trying, but but it makes it worse. Those are the times when I have tried to be king of my own life, and I just plow ahead and plow ahead. I try to fix stuff. I try to control outcomes around me, and it always, always makes it worse, not better. Anybody else? Yeah. I I, I wish I related to somebody else in that story, but I, I'm really in tune with Herod. So I have, a, I have a couple questions, and then we'll sing Silent Night and Light Candles, right? right but um, would I be accurate? Again, I'm, maybe I'm just processing my own stuff, all right? Um, would I be accurate that the one thing you want for your life, it's not gonna be found under a tree, right? You can't get it in a store, right, right, right? The one thing you want for your life that you don't currently have is peace. I mean, when was, when was your last Silent Night? When was the last time you had 24 hours when you weren't worried or stressed or panicked or freaked out about something? And here's, here's my other question. I started with this one. What is it that you're looking for? Like what, what sign are you waiting for to, to have a God that you could believe in and trust? What, what, what are you looking for? What sign would it take for you to say, okay, I'm in, I, I believe. And, but honestly, even if it was written about, across the sky, are you paying attention to what might be in front of you right now, like tonight. See, I don't, again, I don't know what you're looking for. As, as Jesus walked around Israel teaching us, people would come up to him and go, hey, if you can do this, then I'll believe. If you'll fix my leg, then I'll believe. If you can help my daughter, then I'll believe. If you can feed all these people, then I'll believe. If you'll fix my disease, then I'll believe. If you'll do this. And finally, Jesus is like, you, I, I'll give you the ultimate, the greatest sign that you can trust me. And I'm gonna give it to you. The greatest sign that you can trust God isn't gonna be found by like moving pencils, talking Pekingese, all right? Or burning bushes, or even flaming gas balls in the sky. Here's your sign, okay? It will be found on a cross in Jerusalem where a man named Jesus didn't stay in the manger, he grew up, all right? And we're, we're celebrating his birthday, but he left heaven and he came to earth and he laid down his life to pay for your sin and my sin and reunite us with God who loves us. His name is Jesus and he's the Lion of Judah. He's the lamb that was slain to save you and me from our sin. That, th there's no point in having Christmas if we don't have Easter, right? He's the lion and he is the lamb. All right, get, get your candles out. All right, so this is, this is my, I, I told the elders, and I, my staff, we're gonna do this until uh, they fire me or I'm dead. I don't know, we're just gonna do this, all right? Why do, why, see, you're gonna forget everything I said. You're gonna go, how was Christmas Eve service? Go, oh, we lit candles and sang Silent Night. Yeah, I'm not gonna hurt my feelings, all right? Um, although you're gonna look at the stars different. You're like, ah, oh, all right. Um, why, why, why is this so special? Why is it that, like, the darker it is, we catch a glimpse of light, we're like, oh, that, that caught me. Why is it that we, when we go outside, um, if, if there's no clouds, we're just gonna, we, we just find ourselves staring at stars. Why, why is that? And, and I'm gonna throw something out to you. Like, what, maybe the way we're created and the way God created everything and the way he created us is that there's just this intuitive thing looking for something and this triggers it. 
What is it? Hope. Isn't that what you came here looking for? I just need to know there's some hope. Let me, just, let me just tell you this, all right? And this, this, this area over here is cheating. I'm not even sure you're going to heaven over there that's lighting, right? Um, uh, it, you probably will, because it's not up to me. Uh, if it was. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what you need from God tonight. Maybe you need some physical healing in your life. Maybe you need some, some more cash to come your way. Maybe you need a relationship to heal. Maybe you need something stressful to, to come down. I don't know what you need. God does, all right? But listen, ask for it. But there's something greater that you need to answer before that because whatever he does for you in this life, in this marriage, in this family, whatever it is, it is temporary, right? So you gotta, you gotta maybe take care of some other stuff first. And maybe that during this time you could do that. Hey, hey, before I ask you for anything, will you come live inside of me? Will you be my Lord and be my savior? I, I believe as best I can that, that you are the baby in the manger, that you grew up, that you went to a cross, that you, you, you paid for my sin, and if I put my faith and trust in you, all is forgiven. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And during this silent night song, you could do that. You could do that. So at all our campuses, let's stand up. I'm gonna pray. We're gonna sing silent night. And we'll come back together, but... Maybe this Christmas prayer isn't just like for more gifts or more presents or more fix it from God. Maybe this one is, hey, I need something in here fixed and I hear you're the savior of the world. Will you save me? So Father God, in this moment, in this silent night, this oh holy night, where we hold this little light in the middle of a dark, dark room, will you let this remind us that you're the light that came into the world. You're the light that came into our darkness. In the darkness, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how evil it gets, how jacked up this world gets, it, this world cannot overcome you. You, you are God in the flesh. You're Jesus and we worship you in this holy, silent night. Amen.